revisit here at the beginning, and I think it's good to have that for the recording as well, in case uh, folks want to look back. So um, you can hit continue on that. And uh, what I want to do, I guess I can close this now, is um, okay. Let me get rid of all this stuff. Is go ahead and take a look at the syllabus one more time, um, because I guess. I don't know what that green line is all about. I have no idea where that's coming from. Okay. Hope that's not going to bug me all day here. Okay. What is going on? Why am I getting this green? Okay. I, I have a guess. What do you think? I think you have think. to clear annotations. Oh, sorry, Taylor. Yeah, it's a Zoom annotation. I agree with Spencer. Like a third party made that. I watched it happen. Okay. Uh, so uh, you need to go, go to view. You see the little, this is like you were sharing your screen. Mm -hmm. I think if you go to options, you can clear the annotations somehow. Where I go to share. Oh, I see. Annotate. Okay. I got you. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Cause I've never shared a screen that. Clear that all drawings. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. Did, and you're saying that I did that or somebody else did that? Because no, you have the Zoom settings where someone can go and click annotate and just like write on the screen and everyone can see it. Okay. Okay, good. So I got that turned off now too, I think. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, take a look, as I was saying, at the syllabus. And thank you for that because that probably would bug me all day here. Um, just taking a look, we had said, I guess the time before last, before the spring break, that the final exam would essentially um, consist of going through and doing the, um, okay, why are these things? I'm trying to put my cursor on the final exam. So today is going to be one of those days, I guess. Let me close this. I'm just going to close it and reopen it. Maybe that'll work. Let's just go ahead and try this again. And what I'm talking about is down here. Okay, now it's working. Okay, I just want, that's all I wanted to do is that. Okay, so um, what we are talking about here is the final. And I had said the time before we went to spring break, I guess that the final exam, I would give you like an hour or so to work it on the 27th and then we would come back and uh, discuss it. And that would be sort of our, it requires to have a culminating event and that I would give the full points for that exam. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's so, correct. That's what we said. Okay. So I just want to revise that because I think I had forgotten that to be honest with you. And last time I was, uh, saying, well, you know, I'm going to try to squeeze as many chapters as we can in the final and that. And I guess that caused some folks a little bit of a panic attack because just, wait a minute, I was sort of geared my head around that we would spend about an hour taking the final on the 27th. And then we'd come back and talk about it and there'd really be no harm to my grade for maybe not, you know, doing as well on all that material. So um, that's the game plan. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So really, most of your grade is writing on what your write up of the guest speaker and the one midterm, right? Is that correct? Yes. Seems okay. that way. Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. That's fine. And that takes some of the pressure off of me and you, I guess, that um, for today we can finish up chapter four. 
we will get into and potentially finish up chapter five. That clears us then for next time on Tuesday um, to really prep ourselves for the midterm. We won't have an official class. I won't be there on the 15th. You're just gonna have to take the midterm. Uh, I'll open it at class time on the 15th and it'll stay open all the way until we reconvene on uh, at 1.30 on Tuesday, the 20th, right? Yes. Is that the agree all agreed to? Okay. And then uh, we'll just roll from there with the guest speaker on the 22nd. Okay. Thank right. you, Professor Lord. Good guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, ideally it'd be nice if you would under test examination kind of setting, get some practice with some of this material and stuff. But um, then the MSA program, I mean, there, I don't see how you guys live through this, to be honest with you, because I'm looking at, I'm like, I don't see how someone can assimilate a real quality understanding of all this material this fast. So I think it's to avoid. Oh, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I more about accounting, like the more this program goes on. If I went back to last semester, I'd probably do a lot better. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's kind of like, let me show you some stuff, let me teach you some stuff. I, we gotta have some integrity to the program where I'm asking you to do certain tasks, but um, to pour it all into, you know, closed book midterms is probably not the best uh, option for us at this point, especially if we're not meeting face to face and so on, okay? So uh, I think we're okay doing this. I don't think that San Jose State, you know, integrity, uh, academic integrity police are going to come running after us. I think we're okay. All right. Any question? Uh, this is separate from the syllabus, but I think last class we were talking about the, the new differences in the CPA exam. And you said that you could go over those briefly. Uh, yeah, you mean FAR? Uh, what's on FAR, I think, is what the question was. Our audit, all of them would be great, actually. <laughs> um, okay. Because I know FAR, they're removing stuff, but then audit, they're adding stuff, which is kind of what I'm more concerned about, that the addition. N Natalia sent me a really good article from Becker. Um, I can send to you, Brenna. It explains it really well. Can you yeah, send that great. to me, too? And then I'll, um, I'll, we can talk about that next time, if you don't mind, because I forgot about that, too. Sorry, guys. I got a lot of... Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, e I'll, uh, email, I'll email it over. Yeah, email it to me too. And then, you know, I can provide my two cents on that too. So maybe um, email it to me. I'll post it for everyone and we'll talk about it next time. How about that? And you can email it to, to any, you know, your classmates directly if you want to as well. I'm not like I'm trying to be the conduit to which everyone gets it. But um, if you own it to me, then I can post it in the announcements and then we'll talk about it next time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Couldn't, couldn't get to the mute fast enough, but yeah, that works. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry about that. I'm potentially putting my house on the market and it's always extra stuff at that point. Not that you need more information than you need, but, uh, so I apologize that one got, got away from me. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead then and close the syllabus. I don't think we need it. And let's take a look at where we sort of had left off on chapter four. Let's start there, okay? And we kind of left off. I think I looked at this slide and thought, ooh, Okay, this is gonna scare everybody here um, late in the game of our last class. So let's just go ahead and um, save it for this time, okay? So basically what we're talking about here, this is chapter 4B, right? Remember we talked about the budgeting process a little bit and we're talking about how the funds will now, um, you know, use the money that they had um, basically acquired through our revenue recognition steps, right, which we learned in 4A. And now here we're talking about, well, what happens when one fund sends money to the other fund, okay? And you've got sort of a, um, 
two or two broad categories, really. You've got a reciprocal transfer and a non-reciprocal transfer, okay? So this first one, inner fund loans is really a reciprocal transfer, meaning that money's going between the funds, but each fund is getting something back in return, okay? So what happens? And you can see, I put GF up here, okay? That's the general fund, okay? When I put um, GF up there, that's not, that's not girlfriend, that's general fund, and I've lost my pen palette. Any thoughts, guys, on that one? Since you guys seem to know what you're doing and I don't, on how to bring back my pens down here at the bottom of. Um, I've I'm, been wondering. I've never used one, and I wish I knew. Yeah. It used to be that when I was in slideshow. I could see my um, I could see my pens down there and I could choose a pen and write with the pen when I saw fit. And now all of a sudden, for some strange reason, um, the pens have disappeared. Now, if I'm not in slideshow mode, then I have a full set of pens up here. Uh, but I kind of like to be in slideshow mode because then, um, you guys can see it a little bigger on the screen. It's, it's, it's not the same as you had it, but you could pin the pens to like the, oh, I guess that might not work in slideshow mode. Never mind. Yeah, for some reason, I've lost my... Um, Ability to see my pens. They were there before. I don't know what happened. Okay. Well, it is what it is. Okay. I just accept it. Okay. So basically, we have what? We have our inner fund loans. And you could see this GF here. Okay. General fund. Okay. And in the general fund, we're assuming that the general fund is going to loan $10,000. And they're going to loan that over to, and you can see I've got the capital project fund over here. Okay. So what happens in the general fund, when they loan the $10,000, they'll debit loan receivable. That's an asset. It's reported on the balance sheet. So they'll report that asset loan receivable, and they will credit cash for $10,000, right? Because that money is being loaned over to the capital project fund. In the capital project fund, they will do what? They will debit cash when that money comes in and credit loan payable. So it is anticipated that the capital project fund is eventually going to send that money back to the general fund. So we call that a reciprocal transfer. Okay. We call that a reciprocal transfer because what? Hey, they're eventually going to have to send that money back. It's not sort of a one-way deal. Notice, guys, the entire transaction does what hits the balance sheet, right? Everything hits the balance sheet in that example. Okay. Now we come over and we have the interfund transfers. And remember, we've talked about interfund transfers as being the one other finance in use. And it is one of two other financing sources. So now with this interfund transfer, it's non-reciprocal. It's not expected that the general fund will, um, or I guess the better way to say is that the capital project fund will send this money back to the general fund. So now the general fund, instead of debiting loan receivable on the balance sheet, it's going to do what? It's going to debit other financing uses, transfer out, I put IS here because it would be reported on the, we call it statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. But remember, it's like the income statement. We would debit other financing uses, transfer out 10,000, and of course, credit the cash, which is on the balance sheet, because we're sending that cash out of the general fund into the capital project fund. Okay. Now, remember, other financing uses is reported where? on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. Remember, we have revenue, 
minus expenditure gives us excess of revenue over expenditure. And then we keep going to that bottom part, which I said is analogous to the non-operating section of a commercial entity's um, income statement. And in that section, we have other financing sources and uses. So the general fund, we show what? Other financing use, transfer out, 10,000. It's like a non-operating expense, but we don't call it non-operating expenses. We call it other financing use, transfer out. Now in the general, in the capital project fund now, capital project fund, the capital project fund will do what? It's the receiving fund. It will debit the cash for 10,000. Cash is reported, that's BS, that's balance sheet. Cash is reported on the balance sheet. And on the income statement now, there will be a credit to other financing sources transfer in. So on the bottom part of the capital project funds, Statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance, they will show an other financing source. Did I say transfer out? Transfer in as that money comes in. There are only two other financing sources transfer in and long term debt proceeds, right? Question? Uh, yes, Professor, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, for interfund transfers, does it show on the government? government-wide statement? No, government-wide statement interfund transfer is the kind of thing that would be eliminated. So again, we report everything at the um, fund level, but then when you get up to the um, government-wide level, you would eliminate that. So there's no need to do anything with the cash part of this because you report total cash in your um, governmental activity column here. So this transfer between these two governmental funds wouldn't affect the governmental activities cash, but you would debit other financing sources transfer in for 10,000 and credit other financing uses transfer out for 10,000 on the eliminating uh, worksheet to eliminate that, um, that uh, other financing uses transaction and, and sources. Okay, thank you. How about the interfund loans? Same thing. Interfund loan, because it's again, we're reporting everything in the governmental activities column. So, interfund loan, uh, we would debit the loan payable and credit the uh, loan receivable to eliminate that. Just like if you had a loan between company A and company B in a, con in a commercial consolidation. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Okay. All right. Good. Now you come over and on the next slide, we have uh, internal exchange transaction. This is also sometimes talked about as a reciprocal transfer. Okay. But it's basically the situation where say, the internal service fund is going to be providing services to one of the governmental funds, right? So let's say the general fund is getting some service from the internal service fund. I don't know, they're working on some police cars or something and they are billed $5,000 uh, for that service from the internal service fund. Well, the general fund would debit expenditure and credit due to ISF is internal service fund 5,000. The internal service fund, you can see is highlighted here, would do what debit do from the general fund for 5,000. Remember when there's money owed between funds or between governments, we don't use accounts payable. We don't use accounts receivable. We call it what do to, do from, right? So the internal service fund would debit do from general fund for 5,000 and credit revenue because that's what the internal service fund does. It charges the other funds, although on a cost reimbursement basis, it charges them for service and books those as revenue. Now it could be that one of the governmental funds, say the general fund is using the services or resources of the enterprise fund. And that's why I circled that fire hydrant here because what happens if the fire department or something has to use water, right? 
Well, let's say there's a billing for that from the enterprise fund, okay? Then the general fund again with debit expenditure, but now they would credit the uh, due to the, and that's that second part of this sort of, uh, you know, slash here. Uh, they would basically debit due, uh, credit, excuse me, due to the enterprise fund now. And the enterprise fund now would be the one that would sit there and debit due from general fund and credit the revenue now in the enterprise fund because it is possible that the governmental funds could use services of the enterprise funds. Question? Okay, good. So we've got three different ways money can go across. Just let's look at that one more time because I know when you first look at that slide, your eyes probably explode. You have what? You have inner fund loans, you have inner fund transfers, and you have what? Inner fund exchange transactions. Basically, one entity is receiving the service and the other is paying for it. All right. Okay, good. Now, um, I have a couple of slides here that I think are better these last few slides are better understood through the couple of class examples. So I'm just gonna go through those class examples now uh, in a couple seconds here for a lot of those things I just kind of whiz past. Just remember, we don't say much about it here, but we do have the idea of the permanent fund, okay? Permanent fund basically says what? Here's an amount of principal and you have to maintain that principle, okay? So let's say I'm sitting here and um, I'm the great, great granddaughter of Bill Haywards. Bill Haywards is the guy that started Hayward, okay? So apparently what happened is the area that is Hayward, San Leandro, Castro Valley, was all given to somebody by the name of Guillermo Castro. Guillermo Castro got it through a Spanish land grant. And um, he had this, uh, you know, problem that people that were sort of coming to California during the gold rush time would just sort of come and settle on his land. So every now and then, I guess he'd have to get his guys together and ride through different parts of town and chase the settlers or the squatters is what they were off of his land. Well, when he goes to throw Hayward, William Bill Hayward's off, Hayward was a shoe cobbler, right? A cobbler, he makes shoes, right? So he presents Castro with a pair of boots and says, hey, let me stay, look at these fine boots, whatever. Castro decides, okay, this guy's got some talent, so we'll let him hang around. So, over time, Hayward saves his money. And at some point, he basically buys some land from Guillermo. And Guillermo had a little bit of a sort of like a, you know, 1870s version of a party boy. And so he likes to gamble and stuff. So he, last we hear from him, he's heading off to South America. And maybe the 1870s version of the mafia was chasing him. And Hayward stays and builds a hotel in what is now downtown Hayward. And then he gets himself on the uh, Hayward Planning Commission. And interestingly, all the um, carriage lines start stopping in front of his hotel. <laughs> uh, Hayward was a horse trading uh, resort town, believe it or not, in those days that if you're coming from say Berkeley to San Jose, you're gonna stop in Hayward, change horses, and you have to stop right across the street from the Hayward Hotel. So you walk in there and Hayward becomes, you know, somewhat of a prominent figure and eventually becomes the first mayor of Hayward. And then eventually they named the city after him. So let's say that the great, great granddaughter of Haywards says, you know, I want to have a museum and a park put in the middle of uh, Hayward and uh, all the little children can come and see all the artifacts and hear about my great, great grandfather. Well, what happens? Hayward, city of Hayward says, well, we don't have the money to fund that. And 
Miss Hayward says, no problem. Here's $500,000. Keep the 500, keep the principal forever, but any interest, earnings, et cetera, increase in investments that you might make that come off of that, you can use that to run the park, okay? So the idea of the permanent fund, and it's very descriptive, in the permanent fund, we would what, show those resources that are permanently restricted. We have to always keep that principal or corpus, but then we would show what the earnings, interest, and whatnot, and the interest would be expendable. Okay, any question? Okay, good. Yeah, no? Okay, just remember that dumb story, by the way. Um, anytime I tell you a dumb story, it's because at some point there'll be a question, it'll come up, um, in which I'll sit there and um, I'll show you a multiple choice question. It'll be like, remember the story of Hayward? Okay, and that'll help you to understand those, okay? All right, good. So let's go ahead and if there's no questions on all that. Okay, and let's look at those class examples. Okay, and um, this class example here is going to be used to help you to under review the budgetary process of the spending of the money that we talked about last time, but it's also going to show you the closing entries that would be made in a governmental fund at the end of the year. Um, and I just kind of went past the slides there that talked about closing entries because they really didn't give you much information. I thought it was better to show how the closing entries sit in the overall context of the entire process. Okay, so you take a look and we do, uh, we have this entry to establish the budget at the beginning of the year. So at the beginning of the year, we will debit the estimated revenue, we'll credit the appropriations, we'll credit, remember, the account budgetary control, okay? We credit that for 200,000. Now appropriation, remember, is like our estimated spending, but we don't call it that because it has a specific legal definition. Appropriation means that there's been a law that has been signed by the legislature and the executive branch that allows this government to spend money. Without this appropriation, the government cannot spend any money, okay? So they go ahead, they debit estimated revenue, they credit appropriation, they credit this budgetary control. Now, that's a budgetary entry, that's why it's highlighted in yellow. Now, during the year, they actually now have some revenue. So when we're dealing with actual revenues, guys, remember, we don't have to sit here and um, you know kill ourselves to reverse order of journal entries anymore when it's the real accounts, just like in commercial to increase the revenue, you credit it. So we debit the cash, we credit the revenue 2 million. Now what happens? Then we go ahead and we order some goods. And remember we said that when we order goods, we have to debit encumbrance and credit budgetary control. So we go ahead and we order 1.6 million of say some sort of equipment. So we debit the encumbrance, we credit the budgetary control. Now a little bit later, you can see there in line, I guess 19, 1,100,000 of the equipment ordered comes in at an actual cost of 1,300,000. So right now, not everything has come in yet. Okay, let's make sure we're uh, kind of clear on that. Okay, let's just tee up. Let's tee up encumbrance, why not? We're gonna tee up encumbrance, which was first debited 1,600,000, right? And we'll tee up Let's tee up bud control. I think it helps to uh, tee up these two accounts. And what were our journal entries to bud control? 
we credited it for 200,000 there. And then we credited it for what? 1.6 there? Yeah, 1.6 million. Thank you. And now we're going ahead and we are doing what? We are debiting it for um 1.1 million 1.1 for the step that's come in and we're going to credit encumbrance i'm just post posting that journal entry i'm posting that journal entry 1 million 100 thousand and so the balance right now is what 500 thousand if i'm doing my math right okay now that 500,000 represents what? Represents the stuff that I ordered that uh, hasn't come in yet, right? I ordered 1.6 million, 1.1 million, 1.1 million of that has come in. So there's still 500,000 worth of stuff that hasn't come out, hasn't come in yet, right? Yes, agreed. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and you can see I make that note there, and then you can see it, you know, sort of in the uh, T account, right? Right there. Okay, okay, good. But it comes in and it says the actual cost is 1.3. So remember, as we said last time, hey, you know, I go ahead and I encumber for what I think it's going to be, it could come in a little bit different. And if it does, then I go ahead and reverse it for the amount I set it up for. And then I debit expenditure here and credit cash for the actual amount 1.3. Question? Okay, good. And that's all that happens for the year. That's it. Okay, so now what? So now I'm gonna go ahead and I say, let's pull the financial statements and I'm just going to first pull my statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. And I have revenue, guys, I didn't tee everything up. I had revenue of what? Two million. I had expenditures of what? 1.3 million. And I didn't have any other financing sources and uses in this example. And so revenue minus expenses gives me change in fund balance of 700,000 change in fund balance is like net income, right? Question? Okay, good. So I prepared my income statement, just like commercial. First, you prepare your income statement, then you do your closing entries and we'll be able to prepare the balance sheet, okay? So let's take a look at the closing entries that I'm going to make. First, I'm gonna close my real accounts. So I have to uh, debit revenue to close my revenue. I credit my expenditures, right, for 1.3 million to close those, right? Debit the revenue, credit the expenditures. Of course, the journal entry has to balance. And so I'm going to go ahead and in commercial, I would credit income summary or I would credit say retained earnings here. I credit my unassigned fund balance for 700,000 because my fund balance did increase. I'm gonna assume it started at zero. This is this government just starting. It started at zero. Now I need my fund balance to show 700,000, don't I? Okay. But now I need to show the world that not all of that 700,000 is unassigned because I do have what? 500,000 of encumbrances sitting out there because I have ordered these goods. So encumbrance is kind of funny because it depends on the nature of what you ordered that could make it assigned or could make it committed, okay? Um, it could be committed if the government orders a special order item, okay? Let me just use a silly example. Let's say I go to Tesla and I say, hey, I want a Tesla. And they say, sure, you know, we'll get you one. And I say, no, 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 I don't want one of those that's on the lot. I want a pink Tesla 
with golden terrier and I want it to have, you know, some sort of, you know, hoopty um, little frills flying off of it or whatever, right? Okay. Now Tesla says, okay, fine. And they make that for me special order. Let's say when the thing comes to me, I say, I don't want it. What do you think Tesla's going to say? Well, you're paying for it. They're going to say, see this contract? We made this to your specifications. You're buying this thing, right? Okay. So taking it to a government situation, if a government orders something unique, something special, well, that money is seen as committed because, hey, how are they going to change their mind? How are they going to get out of it, right? But let's say you ordered something like one time I ordered my dad a chair because his chair wouldn't recline anymore. And so he sat there with it not reclining and the doctor said, you got to put his legs up. And this is when he lived by himself in Stockton. My brother lives in Stockton. And so my brother was supposed to fix the chair. He never did. So finally I said, dad, I'm just buying you a new chair. So I went and I got ordered the chair and as soon as I ordered the chair, what do you think happened? My brother went and fixed the old chair. Next day, he rushes over there to fix the, the old chair. And my dad says, this is great. And, you know, oh, man, he doesn't want to change his old chair. So now I got to rush to cancel the new chair that I ordered. And I say, hey, I don't want that chair. No problem, Mr. Lord, not a problem. Why? because I didn't order special order. I just ordered something they had and they just canceled it. So if it's something that's routinely purchased and all they got to do is cancel it, then we might want to show that money as, we don't want to show it as unassigned because the city managers have made a decision as to how they intend to spend that money. So we're going to show it as assigned. So we go ahead and debit the unassigned, credit the assigned for the 500,000 that uh, we want to, um, show as uh, something that the city managers have made a decision as to how they intend to spend that money. And I got so wrapped up in my story that I forgot to show um, here. We might first go ahead. We must always close the original encumbrance entry as though the goods came in. We close the original encumbrance entry as though the goods came in. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to debit bud control for 500. And we're going to credit the encumbrance for 500, which is the same thing we would have done as though the goods came in, right? So we sit here, we have zeroed out the encumbrance and right now budgetary control has how much left in it right now? 1,600,000 is all that's left there now? I mean, uh, excuse me, not 1 million. 100,000? Huh? 100,000? Uh, 200,000, thank you. Is all that's left there now? Right? Okay. Okay, good. So, important. You must close any open encumbrance, which is what we did right here. You gotta close any open encumbrance as though the goods came in. That's the same journal entry we would make if those goods had come in this year. So you go ahead and you close that as though the goods came in, debit the budgetary control, credit the encumbrance, and then you do what? You, as I've already described, you set up the assigned or the committed in this case, I assumed it was a sign fund balance for the stuff that's still outstanding, that 500,000. Question? Um, Are we? Oh, please go ahead, Ayaka. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor, I have a question about encumbrance about, uh, mm -hmm. encumbrance account. Uh, could you please explain a little more about why we need this account? Like if they're gonna close it, like reverse all of them at the end, why do we need it to begin with? Um, because like we explained um, last time, and kind of close my slides now, um, we don't want to spend more than our appropriation. 
So if you were looking at, say, I'll just write it in, say this was the appropriations ledger. Okay, and I showed you a slide something like this. Last time uh, we would have the appropriation. And uh, in this case, the appropriation was a credit, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the year. And then we would have a debit for encumbrance and a debit for, so now I've got my, yeah, a debit for encumbrance, that's encumbrance and a debit for expense, expenditure, right? Okay. And then when I ordered this stuff in this example, and uh, let me go ahead and I'm out of room. <sighs> let me go ahead and see if I can get a balance column here. Okay, so immediately after I ordered that stuff, the balance is 1,600,000, right? credit, mm -hmm. right? Not after I ordered the stuff, but when I set up my appropriation, then I go ahead and I ordered the goods and I ordered uh, 1,600,000. Mm -hmm. So is that how much I ordered? How much did I order? Yeah, that was how much the equipment cost. 600,000. So when I do that, when I debit that encumbrance, now that's telling me, you know, you really don't have any budget authority left. So by debiting the encumbrance, when I did, I knew at that point in time that I couldn't order any more against this appropriation. Mm -hmm. Now, when the uh, real amount comes in, okay, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, debit the uh, encumbrance. What was it? 1,100,000? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to credit the expenditure. And, and when I debit that 1,100,000, the balance comes back up here to what? To 500,000? Uh, do you debit it? I, I see on the Excel that it's debit budgetary control. Oh, I, yeah, I'm sorry. So when I debit the, um, when I credit the encumbrance, excuse me, right? Entry here is to, um, the entry here is to debit the encumbrance for, um, credit the encumbrance, I should say, for 1,100,000. Mm -hmm. So when I credit it for the 1,100,000, I stick that into the appropriations ledger, okay? For a split second, this comes back up to 1,100,000, right? When I credit that, okay? But then, and I apologize, I'm just sort of squeezing this in, I debit the expenditure for what? 1 million, Three. 300,000. And when I do that, that brings this down to um, what? 200,000 that's still available. Is that right? 200,000 is the difference between the budget and the actual cost. So now I'm, now I'm uh, sitting here and I don't trust my, uh, my calculations over here. I debit it for 1.6, right? I credit for 1.1, it comes back. Then I debit it for what? 1,300,000. So now it has a debit balance of 200,000, right? Why is this not working? Let's see. 
I had set up my um, appropriation for 1 million. Oh, that's the problem. Hello. The appropriation was what? 1,800,000? Yes. Okay. I was trying to figure out why I was ending up down here so let me do this let me just start this whole thing over again sorry guys it's a good question that's why i want to spend the time with it here um so let's hope this thing will raise for me and let me get some more room here okay and i'll just start this whole thing over okay so i have the appropriation ledger Okay, and in my appropriation ledger, I'll have a credit for my appropriations. I'll have appropriations. I'll just put appropriation right here. That's going to be a credit. I'll have encumbrances. That's going to be a debit. I'll have expenses, expenditures. Those are debits. And then I'll have a balance, right? Let me so far. Yes. Okay. And what messed me up, I, I credited the appropriation for the wrong amount. The appropriation, when I say the wrong amount, in my exa own example here, was a credit of 1.8 million, right? And so the balance here now is 1,800,000 credit, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then... I ordered the goods, and when I ordered the goods, I sat here and I debited my encumbrance for 1.6 and credited my budgetary control for 1.6, right? So when I do that now, now I lost my stupid appropriations ledger. I guess it's over here. Oh, okay, the appropriation leftover is 200,000. We're going to finish this example now. You're not going to cut me off. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we're, we're finishing this now. Okay, so I go ahead and I debit the encumbrance 1600000 leaving a $200,000 balance in here. So now if somebody came up and said, hey, I want to order some more stuff, I'd say and they wanted to order 500,000 worth, I'd say 300,000 worth, I'd say no, we only have 200,000. So by debiting encumbrance, it served as a placeholder so that I don't overspend my appropriation, right? Then oh, I see. a little bit later, what happened? 1.1 million of this came in. So I credit the 1,100,000 and for a split second, this came up to what? Uh, this came up to um, 500,000. Uh, nah. um, 500, Don't worry what it came up to for, well, okay. For a split second, it came up to what? 1,300,000, the balance. But then I went ahead and I put in the expenditure and the expenditure I debited for 1,300,000. Yes. And when I did, this came down to zero, didn't I? So now the word is out, hey, no more stuff can be ordered against this appropriation because what? Because we've spent everything we have available in it. We've either ordered or spend it, spent everything we have available, right? We've spent 1.3. We've got another 500,000 that's hanging out there. That's all we had available was 1.8, right? So this is a long way of answering your question that the reason we use the encumbrance is that it helps us, even though we're going to end up closing it, at the end of the year, it helps us keep track of during the year of how we did against our budget, right? So we didn't accidentally order too much stuff. Question? Um, could you explain why it became zero again? Sorry, I lost track of that part. Okay, well, I had a credit of 1.8. And then I ordered stuff for 1.6 that left 200,000 left. Yes. Of the stuff that I ordered, 
uh, 1.1 worth came in, right? Yes. So I credited the encumbrance, debited budgetary control credit and encumbrance for a second. It yes. came back up to 1.3 because mm -hmm. I didn't need an encumbrance, an estimate anymore. I know the actual expense now, don't I? So I take it away and I put the actual expenditure in there, 1.3. And now I look at my appropriations ledger and I'm like, okay, no more ordering under that appropriation. Or I'm going to have to go back to the legislature and ask them to change the law so I can spend more money for this activity that's represented by this appropriation. Oh, I see. So, there was, oh, yeah, I think I got it. Well, I've used up all the money that was available here. Mm -hmm. I've spent 1,300,000, right? Mm -hmm. And I've got on order 500,000, don't I? It hasn't come in yet. Mm -hmm. So that's it. I can't spend any more money under that appropriation. So this process allowed me to budget my money accordingly so that I'm not sitting there. I, if I went out and ordered something else under this appropriation, I could be personally liable. I mean, city managers could be personally liable under anti-deficiency laws for amount that they spend uh, over and above the appropriation. Now, when I want to say personally liable. They're not going to make them sell their house to pay for something they ordered, but they would be subject to civil money penalties. They don't throw them in jail. They may not fire them for that, but they could fine them for that. So they want to make sure they don't spend more than this appropriation. And you can't, what are you going to do? Let's say you ordered the pink Tesla for 500,000. Well, you're going to have to pay for that, right? So I don't want to order things that, you know, are in excess even of my appropriation. That's why I had to make the entry for the encumbrance. Okay, thank you so much for mm -hmm. explaining yeah. in detail. Yeah, that's not exactly, you know, something that just jumps off the page at you. Any other question? Okay, so by the time I get to the end of the year, though, I want to close that encumbrance, okay? I'm required each year, it's just the way we do it. We close out the encumbrance and we replace that encumbrance with what? We're showing the world now, hey, look, we have an amount that is sitting out there that's going to come in at some point, not this year, apparently, because by the end of the year, if it hasn't come in, we have to put the assigned fund balance. Now our what? Our real financial reports, right? Those yellow is our budgetary entries. Our real financial reports are showing that we have 500,000 that we have spoken for that eventually this stuff's going to come in. And the, the constraint on that spending is a level of assign. Because I guess maybe next year my brother could come and fix my dad's chair and I'll cancel the stuff, right? So there is still some flexibility as to how I can move that money around in the next year. But at this point in time, say 1231, that money is assigned. So now I go ahead and I close my budgetary accounts at the end of the year you always close all budgetary accounts. Your encumbrance is a budgetary account. Your budgetary control is obviously a budgetary account. Your appropriations and your estimated revenue budgetary accounts. All budgetary accounts have to be closed. So I close my appropriations by debiting that, debiting budgetary control and crediting the estimated revenue. And when I go ahead and do that, what? final debit to budgetary control there for 200,000, that is closed out, okay? Now, sometimes students have trouble. They say, I don't understand why we close all those budgetary accounts. Well, think about it. All of those budgetary accounts have their, what? Have their mirror image sitting in what? Sitting in income statement accounts. Estimated revenue, appropriations is like an estimated expenditure and budgetary control is just a placeholder so that my journal entry balances here. And so just like you close income statement accounts, you close your budgetary accounts at the end of the year. So by the end of the year, all of my budgetary accounts are zero. I didn't tee up revenues and, 
and uh, estimated revenues, revenues, estimated revenues, I should say, and appropriations, because there was only one entry there. But I had credited, debited the estimated revenue for two. At the end of the year, I credited it, that closes it. I had credited my appropriation for what, 1.8. Now I debited it, so that's closed out to zero. And I just proved to you that what? Budgetary control is zero and encumbrances is zero just by following our T accounts. So all budgetary accounts have a zero balance at the end of the year. And then I go ahead and I close my, um, well, that's it. I close my budgetary accounts. And now when I prepare the balance sheet, I have what? I have cash of 700,000. I collected what? 2 million of cash. So far I've spent 1.3. I don't have any liabilities in this example. I have what? I have an unassigned fund balance and let's just tee up my help to tee up unassigned. Unassigned fund balance. I did what? I had originally credited it for seven, didn't I? Was it seven? What does that not sound right? I had originally credited it when I did my closing entries here for seven, right? That's that credit right there. And then when I set up my um, assigned fund balance for that encumbrance that was still outstanding, I debited the unassigned and I credited the assigned, right? So, just posting that, now I lost my T account. I do what, then I debited it for five, just posting that. That brings the balance to what? Two, and I'll go ahead and tee it up. For the assigned, I credited it for five. Isn't that what I did over there in that journal entry? I'm just simply posting that. Now, so you had the what? You had the um, situation here where I had credited for seven. And then when I set up for my encumbrance, I debited the unassigned and I credited the assigned, right? And so the now what? The unassigned has a balance of two, the assigned has a balance of five. And that's what you see on the uh, balance sheet, you have your what, cash of seven, you have an unassigned fund balance of 200,000, and you have the assigned fund balance of 500,000. And that 200,000 is what, is really just showing you the surplus that I was planning to have. I'm planning to have a surplus because what? Because I had, uh, appropriations that were less than my estimated revenues, right? Now, at some point in time, you know, the government may decide, hey, you know, the amount that's sitting there in the unassigned fund balance is going to be appropriated somehow, whatever, that's fine. They've got that sort of, you know, if you will, surplus that they can decide to do whatever they decide to do with it. You know, sometimes they get silly with that. They sit there and, you know, when uh, Clinton was president and we ended up with a surplus like for two years, they got into big arguments over, well, we got to send out refund checks for the surplus. I mean, that just shows you how silly they get sometimes. We had a couple of years of a surplus after, you know, a couple of decades of deficits, and then they hurried up to send out of checks that were supposedly going to be a refund of the too much tax they took in and they rushed and they spent all this money sending out refunds and right while they were sending out refunds what happened they're sending out these refund checks because they said they had a surplus and they went through all this political wrangling to hurry up and write everybody a refund check, send everybody a refund check, send everybody a check for $500 for a refund. And what happened? There was no surplus? No, there was a surplus. They sent everybody out a refund check for the surplus. And then what happened the next day? 
while you were going to the bank to cash your refund check, what happened? Didn't uh, everybody's tax refund just go down by the same amount? Well, that's true too. That meant that you weren't going to get as big a refund later because they gave you that money. But what else happened? Mm, I don't you know. Too young to remember. Yep. Some asshole flew a plane into the World Trade Center. <laughs> there went our surplus. There went the whole idea that we would ever balance the budget again because now we were what? gearing up for war, right? And so nobody was paying attention to this nonsense anymore. And I just give you that as a historical perspective, guys, because they play you every day. Every day they come up and they say something else to confuse you. And you got to keep your head wrapped tight to figure out what the hell's going on at any point in time. And that's by design. It's not you, it's them. You know, that's the other thing that always cracks me up is they say, you know, well, the American people, it's their responsibility to, and, and, you, you know, meanwhile, they go through all kinds of trouble to confuse you. Anyway, okay. Any question on this example? Don't trust the government. It sounds like what you're saying. <laughs> Um, well, there's some things you can trust them for, you know, for example, you know, you can trust them to, um, you know, get a vaccine for you. I mean, that's what government is for, you know, when something like this happens, they got us a vaccine. I mean, it was really financed, although it was science that did it in these private companies, but the money, I don't think that Pfizer took any money, but Moderna and uh, Johnson did took money and organization, you know, there's things like that, the, the distribution of the shot. This is the kind of stuff that the government, the government is supposed to do. And it's the kind of thing that's so big that only the federal government can do it. So you can trust them for stuff like that. But when they start getting into nonsense, um, and we're gonna talk about infrastructure assets here today, and they start saying, well, infrastructure doesn't include, it only is bridges, and it's only roads, and they say that. Meanwhile, we're gonna look at the definition of infrastructure assets the Governmental Accounting Standards Board has put out, and infrastructure goes beyond just roads and bridges. Infrastructure assets are things that are part of a subsystem. So if there's something that's part of a subsystem, water systems are absolutely an infrastructure asset. I mean, how do you think water gets to? Do you think some god is sitting up there with a hose? They've got all kinds of systems. When they have to get the water uphill, they got to pump it uphill. When the water starts to need to go downhill, they let gravity do that. You need pipes. You need to keep those pipes fresh and clean to get you the water. Well, that's a subsystem. So when you know Biden stands up there and says, well, we're going to redo do the water systems here, as part of the infrastructure money that he wants. And then they stand up and say, well, infrastructure is only roads and bridges. They just make that up. They just say that so that they have a reason to not be in favor of something that we all need, you know? And then you turn around and you've got the Senator from West Virginia stands up and says that he's against the infrastructure and he doesn't want to raise the corporate tax rate to pay for the infrastructure. And he lives in a state that, that the federal government built their infrastructure. They were sitting out there in the middle of nowhere behind the Appalachian Mountains until the federal government went in there and bored a super highway through the Appalachian Mountains, put them an airport, everything else. Nobody, you couldn't get to West Virginia from here before they went through and the federal government put all that in. So their entire state is federal infrastructure money. Meanwhile, name a corporate headquarters that's headquartered in West Virginia. Go ahead, I dare you. So not only is it this whole sort of thing going on where you're like, you know, okay, well, he's against it. Why is he against it? He's against it because the echo chamber of West Virginia politics is sitting on this idea, infrastructure is only roads and bridges, only roads and bridges, only roads and bridges, only you can't have anything, only roads and bridges. So we're gonna vote against it because 
the echo chamber, the nonsense that they're hitting you with is too loud. The din is so great that the correct decisions can't get through anymore. So I don't know, we've got some problems, but anyway. So yeah, don't believe everything you hear. You can trust the government for some things, but don't believe everything you hear. Okay, any, uh, any question on this example? Okay, good. And I'll try not to uh, go too far off into things like that. Um, you come over now and the question should be, well, John, what about the 500,000? What happens when that stuff comes in, say next year, okay? Well, when the stuff comes in, and that's why I have a year two tab on here, what are we gonna do? In the next year, we put the encumbrance back. So we had to close it at the end of the previous year, but now we put it back by debiting the encumbrance and crediting this account budgetary control, putting it back when, and then we reverse back out the what? the assigned fund balance and put it back into unassigned, okay? Then, so we basically reverse everything we did before. Then when the stuff comes in, and let's say it comes in at 50,000 over the encumbered amount. Well, we go ahead and we debit budgetary control, 500,000, credit encumbrance, 500,000. And then we go ahead and we debit expenditure. And then when I did this example, it was supposedly 2014 money. The 50,000, we might have to pull from the current year's appropriation in this example, 2015. So on our statement of revenues, expenditures and changing fund balance, we could literally sit there and call out our expenditures and label the expenditure showing what year's budget authority that money came from. Now, remember, we did have what? We did have an extra 200,000 sitting there from last year's budget. So maybe this would not be necessary. Maybe we just go ahead and say, okay, expenditure 2014, 550,000, because we do have a $200,000 amount left over, don't we? That we could use against the 20, in this example, 2014 appropriation, because we didn't spend all of it. We still, not the appropriation. We didn't spend all of our revenue from that year. And maybe we would be able to go ahead and spend some of that 200,000 if they went ahead and appropriated it from under the 2014 surplus. But in this example, I just assume, hey, they went ahead and they wrote a new appropriation 2015 and we spent that additional 50,000 out of that appropriation. Question? Okay, so this example, guys, I'm gonna tell you is uh, very important, okay? For you to be able to walk through and sort of understand what we did. Notice we went from the beginning of the year, we went to the end of the year, right? Big takeaways are what? We have a beginning of the year appropriation entry in which we debit the estimated revenue, credit the appropriation, credit budgetary control, by the end of the year, we do what? We simply turn around and close that by the end of the year because it served its purpose. It served the purpose to show us what we had available in appropriation as we went through transaction by transaction and looked at our um, appropriations ledger there, right? Okay, and I may have trouble finding my appropriation ledger over there. Okay. Then what? Then when we order goods, right? We debit the uh, encumbrance, we credit the budgetary control, right? We learned that last time. When the stuff comes in, we do what? We reverse it for whatever we ordered it for, and we set up the expenditure for the actual amount, okay? Once we've gone through the year, we can make our statement of revenues, expenditures, and changing fund balance. Then we go ahead, we close our revenues, we close our expenditures, just like you would in commercial. You close any open encumbrance. And as I've said now a couple of times, you always have to close. You set up for any open encumbrance, you set up what? You set up the, um, the um, assigned or committed fund balance for any open encumbrances. 
And then, as I said, you close the beginning of the year entry. Question? Okay, I can close this. Okay, good. Now, let's take a look at the other example here, which is inventory. Okay, now let me start out by asking you, is inventory a current asset? Yes. Yes. It's a current asset. Good. So that means that my balance sheet needs to show inventory, right? Okay. And then remember, we talked when we were talking about the um, constraints on fund balance, we said that any amounts you hold in inventory are considered what? A non-spendable fund balance. So what this example is going to walk you through is show you how we end up at the end of the year with an inventory asset, show current asset showing on my balance sheet. And how do I end up with an uh, non-spendable fund balance for any inventory that's shown on the balance sheet, because that's going to be the case. I don't care if they drop an atomic bomb. The last thing the governmental accountant's hand will do will reach out of the rubble and make sure that what the inventory account shows the same amount as what non-spendable fund balance. Okay. Now we're going to look at two different methods, but remember the balance sheet's going to look the same regardless of the method, okay? So let's start with the method called the purchase method. And under the purchase method, when I purchase my inventory, I don't debit inventory, I debit expenditure. I purchased 100,000. Now what happens? I show you the balance sheet under both methods and guys, I'm getting in a bad habit of looking at my monitor screen rather than my actual screen. In fact, what I should probably do is just put this back on uh, um, laptop mode. Okay, it's probably a little easier. Okay, so forgive me, I'm not going to be looking at you. I'm going to be looking down here. But the balance sheet, before I do anything, has cash of 100000 and has an unassigned fund balance of 100000 now, under the purchase method, I debit expenditure, I credit cash, and I still have the unassigned fund balance. I haven't made the closing entry. So right now, my balance sheet doesn't balance, but that's because I haven't put any inventory on it yet. And I'm going to do that as part of my closing process. Okay. So let the accountant inside of you calm down a little bit. For a second, my balance sheet isn't balancing, right? Okay. Now, what happens? I say here, assume they use 45,000 of inventory and under the purchase method, they make no entry for the actual use of the inventory. We've already hit expenditure, right? For the 400,000, okay? Now, what happens? This was the only transaction for the entire year and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to prepare the statement of revenues, expenditures and change in fund balance now under the purchase method. So what happens? My revenues are zero in this example. I just didn't deal with revenues at all here. My expenditures are 100,000. So I have a negative change in fund balance of 100,000. So what happens now to close that change in fund balance, I'm going to credit the expenditure I'm going to debit my unassigned fund balance. And when I debit my unassigned fund balance, let's just take a look at the T account for the unassigned fund balance. It started out with 100, didn't it? The beginning of the year up there was 100,000. Do I need to go back? Right there, it started out with 100, right? So my unassigned fund balance, I just did what? I just debited it here when I did the closing of my expenditure right there, I debited it for 100,000, right? That's the little A, I'm just going ahead and posting that. That zeroes it out. So now my balance sheet balances again, doesn't it? I have cash of zero, I have unassigned fund balance of zero, but I do need to do what? Show the current asset inventory. So if I bought 100,000 and I've used 45,000, I count my inventory, how much is left? Uh, 
55,000 is left, right? I bought 100. I've used 45. How much is left? 55. 55,000 is left, right? So I go ahead and I debit my inventory account, 55,000. I credit non-spendable fund balance, 55,000. And so when I look at my inventory account now, it's showing 55,000. Non-spendable is showing 55,000. And when I prepare my balance sheet, which will look the same under both methods, I have inventory 55,000, I have non-spendable fund balance 55,000. Am I happy? Hella happy. <laughs> okay. Question? Okay, now that's the um, purchase method. Consumption method is more like perpetual inventory method and that every time I purchase inventory, I'll debit my inventory account. When I use up inventory, I'll do what? I'll credit my inventory account, right? So what happens? I'm sitting here and remember the balance sheet starts the same and ends the same under both methods, right? Okay, so I've got cash of 100. I've got unassigned fund balance of 100. Then what? Then I go ahead and I purchase the inventory and I purchase the inventory for what? For 100,000, I debit inventory, I credit cash, okay? And then as I use the inventory, I do what? I debit expenditure, I credit inventory, don't I? Okay, I'm just showing you these entries right here. Don't worry about this after part. I'm gonna show you um, this example. In fact, I should probably just delete all this and go straight over here. But you can see debit inventory, credit cash, debit expenditure when you use the inventory, just like the uh, and credit inventory, just like the perpetual method. Okay. Now, when I prepare my statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance, notice there is a difference on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance between the two methods, right? Balance sheets are the same. But the income statement, one is showing expenditure of 100,000, the other is only showing expenditure of 45,000. So there is a difference, right? Now, what uh, Gasby says is they would prefer that you use the consumption method unless the difference between the consumption method and the purchase method are not materially different. And there is no difference on the balance sheet by the time I make the adjustment. So the difference really would be something that would affect the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. And the way there would not be a material difference between the two is if I essentially used the same amount of inventory and purchased about the same amount of inventory year to year, then there probably wouldn't be that much of a difference between the two and you could just use expenditure method, okay? But Gasby prefers the consumption method. Now, let's just take a look and let's review the consumption method. And what I'm going to be doing here is adjusting my fund balance and my inventory account as I go along, okay? So what happens? I purchase inventory by debiting inventory, I credit cash, right? Okay, so now when I post that, I have inventory of 100,000, right? But then at the same time, I update my fund balance. So I debit the unassigned fund balance and I credit non-spendable for the 100,000. Now remember, just going back to the beginning here, my what? My unassigned fund balance was sitting here. Um, balance sheet under both methods come over was 100,000, right? But if I sit here and I debit the unassigned, then it comes down to zero. And the non-spendable now is showing 100,000. So under this method, I update my fund balance as I go along. So the accounting gods are smiling the whole time because I've got inventory on my balance sheet of 100,000. I've got a non-spendable fund balance of 100,000 sitting on my uh, balance sheet. Then I go ahead and I use the inventory. And when I use the inventory, 
I debit expenditure 45,000, I credit inventory 45,000, right? So now the inventory balance is what? 55, just posting that credit right there, that makes it 55,000. And then I go ahead and I debit the expenditure for 45,000, right? Then what? Then I adjust my fund balance. So I debit the non-spendable fund balance for 45, and I go ahead and when I do that, it shows now non-spendable is 55. My inventory is what? 55, so those match. And then I go ahead and I do my closing entry, which is to go ahead and debit the unassigned fund balance for 45, credit the expenditure for 45. That of course closes the expenditure and it brings my unassigned fund balance now down to zero. So at the end, my what? My balance sheet looks the same way it did. Two paths to the same outcome on the balance sheet. The balance sheet looks the same. Inventory 55, non-spendable fund balance is 55. It's just, how did I get there? For the expenditure me um, purchase method, I had to sit there and what, wait till I finished all my closing entries to have everything balanced up. I still had to go through some closing entries here too, but the um, majority of the process was adjusting my fund balance as I went along and used up inventory. Question. Um. Yes, are we talking about the government wide here? No, this is all, um, this is all uh, governmental funds. Okay, so because uh, for the government wide, we would still have inventory but at the government wide level, they don't report, um, you know, unassigned versus um, non-spendable fund balance. So we would have to make an adjustment um, for the um, non-spendable fund balance. We would have to uh, debit the non on the, on the inventory would still show, but on the, um, on the um, government-wide balance sheet, there is no non-spendable category. So we would have to debit the non-spendable for 55 and credit unrestricted. Remember it's restricted, unrestricted and net invested in capital assets. And so we, that would go into the restricted. So we would debit the, the non-spendable and credit the unrestricted at the fund balance level for the government wide. And then we would be okay because we'd still be showing inventory up there, right? When we do our consolidation, the inventory account would just come over to the consolidated column. We'd make that adjustment, which would wipe out the non-spendable fund balance and create an unrestricted fund balance because it's just a difference in not fund balance, but a net assets because it's just the way we um, we call it under a different name. We don't call it restricted. It's not net invested in capital assets. So there's nothing left. It has to go into restricted. Does that answer? Yes, yes. I, I think I'm I, like, uh, maybe I misunderstood it, but I thought for government fund, fund it's uh, fund level, it's a modified accrual method. So I thought we were supposed to expense it when we pay the money. But in this case, Gatsby is actually preferring the consumption method. Um, they prefer a method that is, um, they'd rather you use a method that is closer to accrual, I'll say that. But modified accrual is still consistent with both methods and that we're showing the current asset, right? 
this is inventory as a current asset. Oh, okay, okay, yes. Yeah, so if I purchased a long-term asset, there is no consumption method option, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for long-term assets because we always debit expenditure for long-term items. Okay, got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think about the, um, consolidating entry. If we were using the purchase method, we do have the problem that, um, expenditure is showing a hundred thousand, but yet we only used, um, 45,000. So I have to think through that a little bit more as to how we would eliminate that expenditure of 100,000. We credit the 100,000 expenditure. I don't know, I'd have to think through that. That's probably beyond the scope of what, what we're gonna do. I'll think through that a little bit because we would have the problem that um, the, um, the for accrual accounting, that fact that we showed that expenditure of a hundred thousand is a little bit of a problem. We might we might need to fix that somehow. Um, so let me think about that for the purchase method. Consumption methods, it's fine. You know, it's it's what I said. But for purchase method, we're going to have the problem on the income statement that we're going to have to do something. So the way we would get there for the consolidation might be a little, it's not something that just leaps to mind here. So I'll have to think about it a little bit, but uh, for consumption method, it's the way I said, the consolidating entry. Okay. Okay, no questions? Okay, you wanna take a break and come back and do the quiz or you wanna do the quiz and then take the break? Break. Not the quiz, but the practice midterm. I'm happy to take a break. Break's good. Okay, let's do 315 guys and we will come back. We will go through the practice midterm for chapter four and then we'll uh, see what we can do to do some damage to the slides for chapter five. Okay. All right. Thank guys. you. In about 10 minutes. Okay, so let's take a look at um, this practice midterm, and this is practice midterm for 4B now, okay? And I'm not gonna look at that question because it is repeated. I put the same question in there twice, okay? So let's just start with number two. And the city of Kent Police Department needs a new police car. A police car is ordered at an estimated cost of 34,000 and the appropriate budgetary control journal entry is made. When the car is received, the actual cost is 35,000. Which of the following is part of the budgetary entry that should be made when the police car is received? Okay, and then they start calling out debits and credits. Now, let me tell you in general, okay, for any accounting class, that is a typical way that they like to ask a question where they ask you, oh, hell no. Come on, knock this off. 
Okay, that is a typical question where they sit there and they ask you half of a journal entry. Okay, and that's not how you're trained. You're trained to make what full journal entries, debits and credits. Okay, so when they ask you this and they give you a scenario, your best bet is to sit there and carry out the entire uh, journal entry. So first of all, what's the journal entry when they order the police cars? I know it asked us what to do with this. It's a, it's a debit to uh, encumbrance for 34,000 and a credit to, I think, budgetary control for 34,000. Debit encumbrance, good, 34,000 credit, and I'm gonna abbreviate this bud control. Yep. 34,000, good, excellent, okay. Now, what happens when the police cars are received? What do we credit? What do we debit expenditure? Okay, go in order of what we're, everything we're supposed to do when the police cars are received. Are you reverse the entry? Okay, good. That's what I was looking for. Good. Debit. I know sometimes it's hard to read my mind, but I expect you to. Debit and budgetary control, 34000 and credit encumbrance, right? Guys? And then what did you want to do? Whoever was talking before? The debit expenditure for 35,000 in credit cash for when you actually pay for it. Is that, would that be that journal entry? Yep, debit okay. expenditure 35,000 credit cash, right? Okay, so I think it's helpful, particularly in these questions where, you know, you have the budgetary entry, you have the reversal of the budgetary entry, you have the setup of the actual expenditure that you go ahead and make the whole journal entry, even though the question isn't asking you that when you're taking your midterm here, because then it is easier to look at the choices and see what? Well, did I debit encumbrances for 34,000 when the police cars arrived? No. Did I uh, credit encumbrance for 34,000 when the police cars got here? Did I credit encumbrances for 34,000 when the police cars got here? Yes. Yes, okay. I debit encumbrance, that's, that was never done at all. Credit encumbrances for 35,000, that was never done. So the answer here is B. Question? Okay, good. Let's look at number three. Which of the following is not a character classification? I say chapter three and four. I think this was actually what, chapter two? Okay, so at one time that was maybe three, four question. I might have mislabeled it, um, but I'm asking it in chapter four, but it really was from chapter two. Um, what does the character classification, classification tell you? Uh, it tells you what the nature of the expenditure is. It's well, like a, a all the labels way. that we put on there will tell us something about the nature of the expenditure. So we have what we have program, we have character, we have uh, object class. Right. So what does character tell you? Isn't that just activity? Well, it says which of the following is not. So you want to say. Because activity. it reflects the uh, current um, current economics, right? And then net position, so. So you're saying activity is the right answer? Yes. Okay, and why is why is activity the right answer? And don't say because it's not character. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, K 
because you looked at the answer earlier and remembered that it said activity. <laughs> yes, professor. That's, that's, that's okay. about it. Yeah, that's, all right. Well, look, and I understand you're trying to help me, right, to move the things along. <laughs> okay. But when you look at this, um, look, the other three, okay, are character, and character is telling me about the period of benefit. Okay. So it's going to benefit the current period, obviously, if it's current. If it's capital outlay debt service, well, it could benefit the current period a little bit, but if I purchase something like a steamroller, that will also benefit future periods as well, won't it? Okay, so that's a character designation tells me the period of benefit, which these other three debt service, same thing. If I'm borrowing money paying interest, hopefully I'm seeing some benefit in the future for that money that I borrowed. Activity basically describes what? Describes the activity that's going along with uh, that expenditure. For example, I gave you, and I always tell you, pay attention to my dumb examples. I gave you the example of the uh, friend that I have as a police officer in the city of San Jose. He's retired now, but he would on a Sunday, we'd be watching football and all of a sudden he'd go, oh. Oh, and I'd be like, what? You know, the Raiders won. Why are you upset? Well, uh, on Monday, I have to, I just realized I have to do patrols. Well, what's patrols? And patrols is an activity where he has to drive around in all the sort of not so great motels and hangouts and run the license number on all the cars that are parked there. And if he gets a hit, now he's got to go to the, um, you know, hotel manager and say, okay, you know, who's in room such and such. And then he's got to go knock on the door. You know, what room is this license plate hooked up with? And then he's got to go knock on the door and probably arrest somebody. And generally people are not happy to be arrested. So, okay. That's an activity under what? Under the public safety function. So we have functions and programs. We have what? We have organizational uh, unit, which is the fire and police department under public safety. Public safety would be a program. We have what? We have activity, patrols, and then we have uh, uh, character, talks about the period of benefit. And then we have object class. And object class is really very similar to what you'd see in any accounting entities, chart of accounts, salaries, interest, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, good. There's no requirement, by the way, that a government use any or all of these labels. These are labels that GASB has suggested that governments can put on their statement of revenues, expenditures, and change of fund balance to label their expenditures. Okay, good. Number four. Governmental unit uses encumbrance accounting. We're gonna assume all governmental units do. I don't know of any that don't, but anyway. During the year the government ordered and had not yet received a new police car. What effect will these events have on um, the unassigned balance in the appropriations ledger, okay? Now, this question is a little bit funky and that they say the unassigned balance in the appropriations ledger i think it would be better to say have on the available balance they shouldn't have used the term unassigned because unassigned is very uh specific to our uh, understanding of how we label fund balance so why don't we just say the available balance in the appropriations ledger and not call it unassigned, okay? And so what I'm going to do is erase this up here because I want this space up here, okay, uh, to answer this. But um, let's just go through an example and see how we would use our understanding to answer this question. So let's say I have an appropriation
and my appropriation is a hundred thousand. Should I credit that in my appropriations ledger? Guys? Yes. Okay, good. So that's a hundred thousand. And I'm gonna write my balance way out here just so I don't squeeze myself in like I tend to do. And so I've got a credit balance and this, this is my appropriations ledger right here. Okay. So what's the next thing I should show my appropriations ledger? Is it encumbrance? Nope. Well, look, I'm not going to write it if it's not. It is <laughs> encumbrance. And then I have what? Expenditure. Okay, good. So let's say I order a um, police car and um, I order it for uh, $45,000. What should I do? You had debit encumbrance for 45,000. In, in credit budgetary control? Yes. Good. Okay. So what's the balance in here now? 55,000. Good. Where are you? you? Sound like you're in a park, a beautiful. I am <laughs> at a beach in San Diego. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's I'm okay. sitting outside on the patio. There was something. I'm still in class, so that should mean something. <laughs> there was something about that background noise that had sounds of beautiful scenery. So, yeah, so seven degrees, <laughs> seven degrees, and a little bit windy. That's interesting. That should show you how much I love accounting. <laughs> that a beautiful scenery has a certain sound to it, though, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, good. Well, that's good. Yeah, I am impressed that you're sitting here going through this and answering questions while we go, too, right? Now, if I hear you say, you know, would you like, if I hear, would you like another margarita, sir? Then I'm going to be upset. <laughs> okay. So, what happens? We sit here and we have what? We have, um, just quickly, that comment reminds me of a story. So I used to teach, when I used to teach live classes for the CPA exam, um, you know, we would teach it at a hotel, right? And there's this guy that used to sit in the very front. And what he would do is go to the hotel restaurant, order his dinner, and then he would tell the restaurant to bring him his dinner into the class. So all of a sudden, here would come, you know, these people with the tray to bring this guy his dinner during the class, you know. And he one time he orders a beer. So I don't know, you know, there's really nothing wrong with it, but it was just weird to have somebody sitting there eating their dinner and drinking the beer while I'm up here talking about accounting. I was like, geez, now I know how professional athletes feel you know you're all engaged in what you're doing meanwhile there's some guy drinking a beer and going hey what are you doing that for so anyway. i had a i had a professor i studied abroad with san jose state and oh, i swear huh. to god i think he drank more than all of us students combined on this trip to france during the class <laughs> i hope not during class i don't know it was like during dinners and stuff but i guess technically you could say it was class and it was like he would just like he he would order the biggest beer on the menu and this is france like it's like comes in a bucket practically and then he would start drinking it we're just like what the hell's going on well i could probably out drink all of you too but um, <laughs> what i couldn't what i can't do is where you'll like you know spring up out of bed the next day, I won't. <laughs> so it's how you process it that starts to slow you down. But anyway, okay. this guy was insane. Every day it was it was more and more, more and more drinks. I was like, I don't know. He was in his fifties too. I don't know how he was doing it. Yeah. Well, when I was in China, they kept giving us this vodka. It's called Mao Tai. I think is the name of this vodka. 
And I'm telling you, man, that stuff will kill you if you're not careful. So I was in China. We almost had an international incident. It almost threw up on the people next to me. But anyway, okay. We'll stop there, though, because we could probably keep going drinking stories. So once I order the encumbrance, what happens to my available balance and my appropriations ledger? The available balance will go down. Good. So the balance will what? Uh, the available balance in the appropriations will ledger will decrease? Correct. Okay, good. Very good. Now, this part was not asked, okay? But let's play with this a little bit. Let's say that I order this vehicle, this police car, and it comes in at an actual price of 44000 What would happen on the appropriations ledger? Who wants to give me the journal entry? Period. It comes in at an actual price of forty-four. Expenditure. Okay, give me the whole entry. Oh, 44 expenditure. No, 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 no. Give me the entire process. And part of what's going on here is I'm, I'm pushing your training a little bit here. So don't feel that I'm scolding you. You have to debit budgetary control for 45,000 45, and uh, credit the encumbrance. Good. Debit budgetary control, 45,000, credit the encumbrance, right? ENC's encumbrance for 45,000. When I credit the encumbrance for 45, for a second, this thing comes back up to 100, doesn't it? But then what do I need to do? I'm sorry, was it Ayaka, were you talking? I can't, I don't know who was trying to answer. Uh, Huh? Uh, yes, Professor. What do you want to do next? I, I'm not sure who was trying to tell us. Debit expenditure 44,000, you said? Yeah, 44,000. Good. Credit, credit cash? Good. Assuming we pay cash for it, right? We may pay it later, but whatever. We're going to debit expenditure for 44. And when we do, now the balance here is what? 56. Is 56,000. Okay, good. So the balance in that situation, what comes up? So I could ask you a question like this and describe this whole thing. They ordered something and then it came in for less than the um, encumbered amount. What would be the effect on the appropriations ledger? Then the answer is going to be it's going to increase, isn't it? Well, we'll make an adjustment to push it up, but won't it still, won't appropriation still have a lower balance than before the order? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yes. I mean, I'd have to write the question. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. I could tell you all that and then say, what would, would all this have as an effect? And it would still decrease it in that case from 100 down to 56, right? I think so. Yeah, I'm trying to yeah. figure yeah, it did. It's right there in front of you. If I gave you a whole scenario and said, what did the whole thing do? It still decreased it by fifty uh, by 44,000 down to 56. But if I said, what would the receiving under this scenario uh, do? Then it's going to increase the available balance, right? Did I say decrease? It's going to increase the available balance, right? It would have gone from 55 to 56. Yeah. Right. Okay. These are all credits. Okay, good. All right, let's take a look at number five here. And it tells us the public school district budget estimated revenues of 800,000 and approved appropriations of 780. Which of the following is the appropriate entry to record the budget? Don't even look at the choices, guys. Just from memory here, give me the journal entry for the budget. <laughs> what is the entry I make at the beginning of the year when I adopt the budget? Estimated revenues. 
debit estimated revenue for 800. Good. Keep going. Okay, good. I think we heard you say credit the appropriation for 780. Yes. I need a $20 credit to make this journal entry balance. What's that going to go to? Good. Bud control. Excellent. So what's that? Choice what? A. Choice A. Okay, good. Um, can you, just to refresh my memory, can you explain that breakup of 780 and 20? 780 is the appropriation and 20 is the surplus that becomes a credit to budgetary control. Oh, time for, got it. Yeah, so I always debit estimated revenue. I always credit appropriation. If it's a surplus, I credit budgetary control. If it's a deficit, I debit budgetary control, right? So that one can flip from debit to credit depending on the surplus or budget or deficit situation. Okay, cool, thank you. That refreshes my memory. Yeah. Okay, good. Number six, do you see the strategy guys of recording the entire journal entries rather than sitting here and, um, you know, trying to figure out half a journal entry by looking at the choices. You make the entire journal entry, then, okay, I don't know what they did to me. Why do those little marks bother me? Somebody must have like messed me up as a child, okay? All right, so let's look at number six with the strategy of sitting here and making the entire uh, journal entry. Uh, for one where they ask you debit credits. So a county general budget includes budget, budgeted revenues of nine, budgeted expenditures of 890, actual revenues of 950 to close the estimated revenue account. Well, let's go through the entire process. What do you do at the beginning of the year to set up to open the budget under these facts? Debit estimated revenue for 900. <laughs> Good, I would have debited estimated revenue. Very good for 900. Um, and then what? Credit. Credit appropriation. Don't call it estimated expenditures, guys. Don't fall into that trap. Even though they called it budgeted expenditure, the correct term. That's one of the terms that, you know, you got to be using the correct term. It's appropriation of 890. Good. So I need what, a 10 to make this journal entry credit, $10 credit. What's that to? Budgetary control. Good. That's going to go to budgetary control. Good for 10. Okay. Then. They tell me I have actual revenue of 915. Let's say it's for cash. What do you want to do? I collect cash revenue. Cash for 915 credit revenue for 915. Good. Debit cash 915, credit revenue 915. Good. And then we come to the end of the year. What do you want to do for the budgetary? You simply reverse it, guys. You simply close it. Debit by control, 10. Debit appropriation, 890. Credit the estimated revenue for 900. Oop. Right? Hello? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. All right, let's take a look at number seven. Okay. And um, I guess I'll go ahead and 
do some writing up there for number seven, looks like, okay? So Carolina City places an order for a specific item of equipment <clears throat> and encumbers 6,000 for that item. The equipment arrives at an invoice price of 75,000. Which of the following entries would the city make upon receipt of the equipment? And again, they give you these weird presentations of your choices. If you make the entire journal entry, it's pretty easy to figure it out. So what's the journal entry for the whole process? Um, the first. encumbrance for 6,000, credit right budgetary control for 6,000. Good. Debit encumbrance, 6,000, right? Credit, bud control for 6,000, good. Then the stuff comes in, it comes in at an invoice price of what? 5,700, so what do you wanna do? Uh, first reverse the entry. Good. Debit bud control, 6,000. Credit the encumbrance, 6,000. That reverses that. And then what do you want to do? Expenditure of uh, 5,700. And then uh, vouch payable, maybe. 50, uh, voucher payable, cash, whatever, good. 5,700, good. And they gave me vouchers payable, so that's why you wanted to do that, right? Okay, good. So now I look, and did I debit expenditure for fifty seven hundred, and debit voucher payable for three, and credit encumbrance for six thousand? No, that sounds like the teacher that was drinking all day and night. No. <laughs> huh? Did I debit expenditure for fifty seven hundred? Debit budgetary control for six, credit accounts payable or vouchers payable for 5,700 and credit encumbrances for six? Yes. Yes. Okay. You see the strategy, guys? Got it. If you sit there and you just try to do this entry from your head without writing all this down and then comparing it to the answers, you're bound to, you know, have a bad experience. Okay. But if you sit there and patiently go through, methodically go through the entries like that, um, it becomes a heck of a lot easier. Question? Okay, number eight, a city uses the purchase method of accounting for supplies in the general fund. At year end, the amount of supplies on hand is material to the city and it wants to report the inventory on the balance sheet. Guys, we'll always assume we're gonna report it on the balance sheet. How should general, how should the general fund record the inventory? Okay, so let's just remember that at the end of the uh, year, we still have to do what? If we had 55,000 left, we'd have to debit inventory for 55 and credit what? Expenditure? Non-spendable fund? Good. Credit non-spendable fund balance, right? I know we kind of went through that a little bit quickly there at the end. That's a credit. We have to credit non-spendable fund balance under the uh, purchase method to set up the inventory, don't we? Yes. Okay. So what's the right answer here? Uh, D, non-spendable um, fund balance. Right, right, because we would have debited expenditure for, let's just review the whole thing. We bought the inventory for 100,000, right? So we debit expenditure under the purchase method, credit cash, whatever, for the full 100,000. Isn't that the little example I brought you through? And then at the end of the year, we counted up the inventory. We didn't adjust the expenditure account or anything for the actual use, but at the end of the period, if we use 45, we counted up the inventory, there's obviously 55,000 left. So at the end of the year, we got to do this, right? Yes. Okay. It's right off the example that we went through that question. 
I mean, the numbers even. Okay, it's a sin. Question? Number nine, which of the following describes the proper accounting procedure for supplies in the general fund? Okay, let's read these. Supplies may be accounted for as expenditures either when purchased or when consumed. In either case, material amounts of inventory are shown on the balance sheet. What do you think? I just look at this and I, I say it's the longest one <laughs> that prevails. <laughs> so I think it's right. We have the um, the purchase method and the consumption method, uh, which are the two ones that we learned earlier today. And we also know that anything material uh, should be on the balance sheet. Correct. Okay. I mean. I'm not sure what test taking technique involves choosing the longest answer as the correct answer, but I, I can't let that go. I mean, I was talking to somebody and um, they were complaining because all I talk about is how to pass a CPA exam. And so I started getting mad and I started hitting the granite counter that I have in my house. It's a pretty nice counter. And I said, you see this counter? This counter was paid for by me telling people how to pass the CPA exam, okay? So I can't let that go. You know, no, the longest choice is not, uh, is, is that never a way to look at how you might choose an answer? You know, you look for answers that potentially have you know dogmatic statements and say you must always those you know this is assuming you don't know how to answer the question and a lot of times you can eliminate some of those but the length of the answer does not indicate correctness okay all right um, that's all i just let that go now but um, which of the following describes a proper accounting procedure for supplies supplies may be counted for as expenditure either when purchased or when consumed. Under the purchase method, we set it up as an expenditure. Under the consumption method, we did what? For this same example, we debited inventory and credited cash. When we bought the inventory, that's the consumption method. And then when we used the inventory, we did what? Then we debited expenditure for 45 and credited the inventory for 45 as we used it. And so this was what? This was consumption. This was, as we know, what? Expenditure. I mean, not expenditure, but the purchase method, right? Okay, those are the two methods. So yeah, you could treat it as an expenditure at the time that you buy it, or you can treat it as what? You can treat it as inventory at the time you buy it, but under both methods, at the end, remember I said under both methods, we saw inventory, non-spendable fund balance. They both ended up in the same place. Okay. Is there any question about any of the other choices? Okay, good. Number 10. In the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance, a transfer received by the debt service firm from the general fund should be reported by the debt service fund as, so who's getting the money here? The debt, debt service fund. fund. Debt service fund is gonna receive the money. And when you receive money from a transfer, how do we classify that? Okay. In it's other financing sources, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so in the debt service fund, they'll debit cash, they'll credit other financing sources, transfer in. What about the general fund? Assuming, yeah, general fund's the one that's sending it. How about the general fund? What are they going to do? They're going to have a other financing uses transfer out. Good. Oh, oh, source. No, no. It's a use. Oh, okay. Transfer out. There's only one other financing use. It's transfer out. 
And they'll, of course, what? Credit the cash, right? You got it. Okay, number 11. Okay, now number 11 was a full-blown problem that I gave a class some years back, and uh, I don't do that anymore. I tend to stick more with the multiple choice questions, but I gave it to you for practice purposes because it's a pretty good review of some of the uh, key points that we've covered here in this chapter 4B. Okay, so let's just go ahead and uh, let's start to take a look at what happened here. And they give us all this information and they have the estimated revenues. They have the appropriation here. Right. The appropriation is here. Okay. And then they show the amounts that they have encumbered. They show for the amounts actually received, what was the estimated or encumbered cost hint, hint for those, what was the actual. They give me the revenues and they tell me that it's net of 1% uncollectible, okay? All right, so they give me all of this information and then they want me to go ahead and prepare a set of journal entries for this, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's start to take a look and let's just jump back and forth for the solution here. So notice I debit the what estimated revenues for the amount of the estimated revenue. I credit the appropriation for the appropriation and they didn't really need to tell me what the difference is. I know that the difference goes to budgetary control, doesn't it? Then they tell me that they encumbered 12.4, whatever, 12,400,000. So if they encumbered that, I'm going to go ahead, debit encumbrances, 12,400,000, credit the budgetary control. Then they tell me that they received 10.9 of that, okay, at the budgeted amount, right, at the estimated amount, 10.9. So I go ahead and I debit the budgetary control 10.9. Where'd my, where'd my budgetary control? I debit the budgetary control 10.9. I credit expenditure slash voucher payable cash, whatever, for the actual amount, don't I? Question so far? This is kind of a fun question, okay? Okay, good. Then I got to set up the um, uh, revenue and I know that I credit revenue, what? Net of the allowance. Now you're sitting there and you're saying, well, if the um, allowance is, is 1% is uncollectible, that means that what? That means that point 0.99 times the taxes receivable will equal the revenue. I know that the revenue is what? I know that the revenue is 13,000. So 0.99 of whatever the taxes receivable are will, will equal 13,000. So I take the 13,000, I divide it by what? 0.99, that means then that my um, tax is receivable, right, equals one, three, one, three, one. If you take 13,000 divided by 0.99, you get one, three, one, three, one. And so that's the tax is receivable. They told me the revenue is 13, so I know I got to credit the revenue and I credit the allowance for 131, right? So I reduce the revenue by the amount I think I'm not going to collect. Okay, 
Now, where some students, when I gave this question to them, messed up, they forgot to do what? They forgot to close their appropriations. You got to close your appropriation. You reverse the original appropriation entry or our appropriation, our original entry here. We simply reverse it, don't we? See how you throw away easy points if you forget that easy that you have to reverse it. Now let's look at the encumbrance for a second. Okay, so the encumbrance, how much did I originally debit it for? 12,400, is that that right there? Okay, and then when the goods come in, I credited it for what, 10.9? So that leaves me a balance in my encumbrance at this point of what, 1,500? Right, am I doing my math right? Do I have to close this? Do I have to close my encumbrances to zero? Yes. Yes, I do. So what do I do? I debit budgetary control, I credit the encumbrance for 1500 as though the goods came in. I know they haven't come in yet by the fact pattern, but I have to sit here and still close that. And then I do what? Then I debit the unassigned fund balance and I credit the assigned fund balance, just like we did in the sort of comprehensive example I gave you. And then of course, remember you have to do what? you have to close your um, actual accounts. You debit the expenditures, you debit the revenue, you credit the expenditure, you credit fund balance for 18. Now, the other thing that I asked for in this, along with the journal entries, was an analysis of fund balance, okay? Of the unassigned fund balance is probably what I, sh I don't think I said. Oh, I asked for both the unassigned and the assigned. Okay. So the um, unassigned fund balance is what? I mean, the assigned fund balance is what? That's easy, it's 1500, right? Okay, because that was the only entry that we did. But for fund balance, unassigned fund balance, It started out with what, 1,500? Where do they tell me that? Started out with 15, okay? And then I went ahead and I did what? I credited it for what, 18 right here? And then I turn around and I did what? I debited it over here for 15 when I set up that assigned fund balance. So ending balance is how much? 1800. Yep. Okay. You want me to give you a question like that on your exam? No. <laughs> okay, I won't. But um, this is good. I mean, this is a good one for you to, to practice with, okay? Because it kind of walks you through that whole process. That combined with the comprehensive example I gave you, okay? Okay, good. Um, just if you're wondering, we're not going to get to Chapter 5, so we'll do Chapter 5 next time. Um and then we'll, what we'll do is that quiz, that practice midterm for chapter five is really short. So we'll do that and then we'll get into the uh, full practice midterm um, that will include information from chapters one through five. And uh, then we'll, you know, we'll see where we land at that point. Okay, but we're gonna push chapter five next time. And let's go ahead. Uh, yeah. Professor? Uh-huh. Speaking on the practice midterm, I know it's kind of separated in chapter practice midterm one and two, but since we have the consolidation of midterms, um, which ones should we, should we practice from this weekend? 
but I, I would like to practice from it this weekend. One and two. Um, well, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna open up here probably tomorrow or so the practice midterm. That's okay. Well, that has questions from all the chapters. Because I think that's available already on Canvas. Oh, okay. Well, then what are you asking me for? <laughs> oh, I was just wondering, like, because uh, all, all three of them are open. So I was wondering, since since we're consolidating one and two into one midterm, should we just practice one and two then for the first midterm? Oh, I see. You're talk I thought you were talking about chapters. I got it. So, oh, yeah, no. practice midterm one and two. Yeah. Okay. Well, I already opened those. I didn't realize I forgot I had already opened them. Yeah, the only thing is I'm going to probably have to come up with some extra chapter five stuff because I think that those practice midterms contemplated chapter one through four being on the first midterm. So it's not showing you any chapter five questions right now, I don't think. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't gone through it too much. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, this weekend, whatever, um, you can look at the two practice midterms that I've apparently already opened up. And then um, probably what we'll do is I'll have to try to search out some additional chapter five questions. So that okay. we're just limited to what we have for the chapter five specific practice midterm. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, let's go ahead and actually, instead of just sort of doing it in our mind's eye of what we were talking about there. So let's do it this way. Okay, that's your view. And practice midterm, you got first practice midterm one, you've got second practice midterm one you've got third practice midterm one so you got three of them so yeah you could look at those this weekend um and as i was saying the only thing that i think is missing from those is there's no chapter five questions in those because those were originally set up contemplating that the first midterm would just be chapters one through four you do have and we know we haven't looked at it yet a chapter five practice midterm but you know that's only like nine ten questions or something so i'll have to cough up i think some additional chapter five stuff for you to practice with but i don't know when i'll do that but maybe that'll be available for us that that'll have to be available for us by tuesday does that make sense yeah sounds like a plan okay okay good Let's go ahead then and keep going with, where were we on the practice midterm for chapter four? Okay, how should a city's general fund report the acquisition of a new police car in the governmental fund statement of revenues, expenditure and change in fund balance? Expenditure. Good, that's an expenditure, right? Okay, excellent. Okay, good. Let's take a look at number 13. Spruce City receives good at a cost of 9,700 that are encumbered in the prior year for 10,000. Which of the following entries are required uh, assuming encumbrances lapse at the end of the year, which is the same thing as saying, hey, at the end of the year, I would have closed the um, encumbrance account when the stuff wasn't uh, wasn't received. So who wants to start this one off? We got two years going on here, right? What happens in year one when I order this stuff? I'm kind of writing up there so I can co op some of that space up there. Uh, we make a debit to encumbrance for $10,000. Good. Debit encumbrance, 10000 Excellent. And then a credit for the same to bud control. Good. 10,000. Excellent. Okay. Now the stuff doesn't come in um, until the prior, um, until the next year, right? It was ordered the prior year. 
So what do you want to do at the end of year one? This is a guess, but are we just going to reverse it? Yeah. If the stuff hadn't come in yet at the end of the year, you reverse the budgetary entry as though the stuff came in, right? What else you want to do? At the end of the year. Debit expenditure and no. credit payable. Not at the end of the year, because the stuff hasn't. Close encumbrance. I just did. Oh. Yeah, unassigned and credit assigned or committed fund balance. Say it again. Okay. Well, that sounded kind of right. I can't. I can't quite hear. But oh, I think so. What? Matthew. Okay, hang on. Are we having some interference here or we're good now? Okay. okay. Sorry, that was my fault. Of, of, or just pooped right next to me, so I kind of got pooped oh, yeah, down, right there. Sorry about that. Okay. You can mute that though. Okay. All right. What do you want to do? Somebody was saying the right answer. You want to do what? Debit unassigned and credit assigned or committed. Right, debit the unassigned for 10,000 and credit the assigned or committed, we'll just do assigned, okay, for 10,000, fund balance, right? Unassigned fund balance, let's be a little more precise there. Debit the unassigned fund balance for 10,000, credit the assigned fund balance for 10,000, good, okay. That's at the end of year one. What do you want to do in year two? Year two, I'm going to what? Do we need to debit encumbrance again? Okay, you want to debit the encumbrance first? That's fine. Year two, I'm going to debit encumbrance for 10,000. Credit bud control for 10,000. What else do you want me to do? And debit expenditure for 97,000. Well, not yet. I'm going to reverse this. Oh, yes. I'm going to debit the assigned fund balance for 10,000. And I'm going to credit the unassigned fund balance for 10,000. Okay, go ahead. Now, what do you want to do? So I basically just reversed all this, didn't I? Put all this back, essentially. Well, not all that, but I reversed all this right here. Now, what do you want to do? We're Is there a next step for receiving the goods? Well, I miss, yeah, I miss, well, now we received the goods. That's right. Yep. Next, we got to receive the goods. So, what do you want to do now? So, do we need to in, reverse the encumbrance account again? Good. Debit the bud control 10,000, credit encumbrance 10,000, right? Just kind of squeezing this in the margin here. Okay, good. And then what? And expenditure. Debit expenditure for 97 and credit vouchers, accounts payable, whatever for 9,700. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So after you do all that, did you debit expenditure for 9,700 and credit accounts payable for 9,700 and make no entry for encumbrance? Nope. No. Did you debit expenditure for 9,700 credit budgetary control for 10 credit accounts payable for 97 and credit encumbrances for 10 did you debit expenditure for 9700 yep did you debit budgetary control for 10000 
Did you credit accounts payable for 9,700? Did you credit encumbrances for 9,700? Yep. Okay. Again, it gets, it's hard to discipline yourself to do all that. But if you don't, you can get lost in this thing pretty quickly if you don't walk through the entire process of what the problem described to you. Uh, it's real easy to get yourself lost. Okay. All right, let's do one more. And then we're going to stop. And then we're going to, um, in fact, yeah, we'll do this one more and then we're going to stop. Now, let's stop there. We're going to stop there. Continue to look at the rest of this one. We'll pick up here next time. And then we'll get into the uh, practice midterms that you saw that we looked at a minute ago. So it is worthwhile to for you to go ahead and keep looking at this on your own. We'll finish it together and then we'll look at those. So we'll be in full um, midterm prep next time. We're not gonna look at, uh, oh, I said we would look at chapter five, didn't I? What we'll do next time, yeah, we gotta look at chapter five too. So we'll finish this next time We'll look at chapter five and then we'll do the practice midterms. I think that's better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sound like a plan? Yes. Okay, guys, keep looking at this. You could start to look at the practice midterms for uh, the, the more full blown ones. They have questions for one through four if you're looking for some stuff to do this weekend or if you wanna look at some of those modules that I talked about last time, that would also be useful for you. Okay, guys. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. We'll see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Thank Professor. you. You too. Okay, thanks. Professor. Question? Uh, yes.